Speaker to welcome all of you this even, to this evening's presentation of the President's Speaker Series. Today we are privileged to have Emily Bazelon with us to share her thoughts on the issue of bullying in our modern world. Ms. Bazelon is a graduate of Yale College and Yale Law School. She lives in New Haven, Connecticut with her husband, Paul, a professor at Yale, and their children. Ms. Bazelon is a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine and the Truman Capote Fellow for Creative Writing and Law at Yale Law School. In addition to being a frequent guest on the Colbert Report, her writing has also appeared in The Atlantic, This American Life, O Magazine, The Washington Post, and Mother Jones, to name but a few publications. Ms. Bazelon has recently been in the spotlight for her book published in early 2014, Sticks and Stones, Defeating the Culture of Bullying and Rediscovering the Power of Character and Empathy. Today, she will guide us through the social and legal ramifications of bullying and demonstrate how the use of new technologies can both spread and combat it. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind you to turn all your mobile devices to their silent modes. And when it comes time to ask questions, please make your way to the standing microphones in the aisles. Uh, please join me in welcoming President Lewis, who will further introduce Ms. Bazelon. Thank you, Zach. Uh, I, I wanted to add a little bit to Zach's introduction of Emily uh, Bazelon. About Emily's career, I wanted to add that after uh, graduating from Yale College, she uh, was a reporter in uh, Berkeley, California, and in Israel for a few years uh, before going back to Yale to the law school. She was a clerk uh, for a uh, judge on the First Circuit um, Court of Appeals, which is one of the federal appeals courts in New England. Um, and then she was part of the founding staff of Legal Affairs, uh, a magazine about the law uh, that was based in New Haven, Connecticut, before it later joining Slate and now the New York Times. Um, one of the interesting things about Emily's career that might be interesting to those of you who are either studying law or thinking about journalism is uh, that she's uh, part of a, uh, uh, an, approach, a journalist, an approach to journalism and the law that I think is relatively new in the United States, but as you know, uh, many of you are Americans and the others probably know, uh, the Supreme Court plays a very big role in American life that's different from the role of courts in most societies, uh, although it's increasingly emulated in other parts of the world. Um, and uh, Emily's written about Supreme Court decisions, but also about the role of courts in, um, in society. And I think one of the particularly interesting things about her work is that it, it tackles a lot of issues relating to gender, um, sexuality and, and uh, other and family topics, topics that in a way might at one time have been thought about as not hard news but on the family pages, but is actually taking it from a very hard news legal angle and that includes issues like pornography, sexual assault, um, as well as bullying and a lot of issues that are having to do with child, uh, children and child rearing. Now I was, I've known Emily for a long time and I was interested to read her books her book, um, during the summers, you know, when I'm writing my speeches, which you all listen to at the beginning of each academic year, I often read books to give myself ideas for my speeches. Uh, and it happened that I read three books this past summer, all of which uh, were written by friends of mine, and all of which, it turned out, dealt with the issue of character. So um, my, uh, a, a mutual friend of Emily's and mine is Paul Tuff, whom I knew back in school who's written a book called How Children Succeed, which is essentially about the importance of character and grit and resilience in, um, in raising children. And ultimately, I think it's quite relevant to what we do at Yale and U.S. College. And Emily will tell you herself about uh, her book, uh, Sticks and Stones. And then a, a, uh, a uh, Paul I knew when we were kids, and so it's interesting to see what he thinks about kids. Emily and I have in common that we've, uh, we have children the same age. So uh, Emily was at Yale Law School at the same time as my wife, uh, but also our kids have known each other for the entire 15 years, uh, four, 14 and a half years of their lives. Um, and so seeing the take on middle school of another parent of middle schoolers uh, who's been through it all with me was really very, very interesting to me. And the third example is Bill DeResowitz, who's a former colleague of mine at Yale who's written a book called Excellent Sheep, which is about elite education. So these books also sort of cover the range of education from elementary and middle school, high school, up to university. Bill has just written to say that he's going to come and be part of this present speaker series. So next year, we'll get a chance to ask Bill about elite education and how it fits with what we do at Yale and US, which of course is not the same thing. <laughs> 
Uh, and uh, I'm also working on Paul, so we'll have a nice little series on character here. And it gives me great personal pleasure uh, uh, to welcome Emily to talk about character and bullying. I think it'll be very relevant to us, even though we're all a very nice and loving community. Uh, we've been through certain issues, like the confessions page, and I hope we get a good chance to talk about how some of these issues affect our community as well. So Emily, thank you for being here. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction. Um, it's so nice of all of you to come and give me some time this afternoon, which is time is one of the most valuable gifts that we all can give each other. Um, and that was a great introduction that gave you a sense of my journalism over time. And if any of you are here because you have questions about journalism um, or you really just want to know what Stephen Colbert is like, um, feel free to ask me a range of questions um, when I'm finished talking. Though I will concentrate here on my book and these questions of um, child welfare that I'm interested in. Um, I got interested in bullying about five years ago when there started to be a lot of coverage of um, bullying and its intersection with technology. And one of the um, nice things about this topic is I find that people bring their own personal experience to it and often some pretty deep memories from childhood. I've given this talk many times in the United States, but this is the first time I've given it um, what for me is abroad. So I'm going to ask you a question I've asked before, and I'm interested if I'll get a similar or different resp response from this more international audience. Um, and so my question is this, if you look back into your own childhood, because I'm interested in, or I'll be focusing today on bullying really in um, childhood and in the teenage years. So if you remember back, do you feel like you experienced being a victim of bullying when you were growing up? And if you did, could you raise your hand? Um, and who remembers feeling like they witnessed someone else being bullied? And in the zone of um, community and safety of this room, um, who would admit that maybe at some point they might have acted like a bully? Um, so you're seeming so far pretty typical of the American audiences I've spoken to, in that most people bring some sense of personal identification to this issue, and I usually see most people's hands go up, if not for you know, two or three questions at least once. Um, during the course of uh, discussing this. So that raises a kind of fundamental question of definition. Um, what do we mean when we talk about bullying, and in particular, when we call someone a bully? So I'm going to start by showing you my effort to answer this question when Stephen Colbert asked me about it on his show, when my book came out. Are, are, you, are you saying that we don't think enough about bullying or that we think too much about bullying? So we need to figure out how to use the label sparingly. We, don't, we need more people, more researchers thinking about how to prevent it and how to help schools and whole communities, families, solve the problem. Do you think I'm a bully? <laughs> so I thought about this a lot. I think sometimes... <laughs> It's okay, whatever, whatever the answer is, I is the answer. I think sometimes you bully people, but I don't think you're always a bully. And also, your guests, we, so we don't have as much power as you, right? Uh-oh, I'm sorry. We, you're more powerful than us. Let me remind you, you're a big, powerful TV host, right? Yeah. So, and you almost never make that face. What? Really. You're, you're always in control, and we're the ones who are, we're the ones who are more at your mercy. Usually, but... <laughs> I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Sorry. But you're not a bully because you could change. And also because we're here, obviously. It's our choice to be here. It is your choice. Yeah. So it's kind of sometimes it's like the nerd's fault. <laughs> no. Um. So underlying uh, that marvelous humor is, um, I think, a serious point, which is that nobody wants to be labeled a bully. It's a really stigmatizing thing to be called, especially for kids. And so when we're talking about bullying as a social problem that adults should be concerned about and involving themselves in, I want to argue to you that we should be using a limited definition. 
Um, the definition that makes sense to me comes from originally a Scandinavian researcher named Daniel Olveus. And in 1969 and 70, he asked about 400 teenagers in Stockholm a question that nobody had thought to ask kids in a systematic way before. He asked them, what kind of mistreatment, what kind of behavior from your peers really bothers you? What gets under your skin and distresses you and sticks with you? And what he found from talking to these kids was that the kinds of mistreatment could take different forms. It could be verbal name calling, it could be someone getting beaten up, it could be social exclusion. But what really troubled kids was when this behavior was repeated over time and when it involved a power imbalance. And so the way I translate that myself is to think of this as like a campaign to make someone else miserable. Um, and that, I think, we can all agree is something that we would not want our own kids doing and that we would not want our own kids experiencing. So that limited definition of bullying really matches up with the kinds of behavior with, among teenagers and younger kids that causes a lot of trouble for victims as they're growing up. You know, it's linked to not doing as well in school, substance abuse problems. Um, for kids who bully, it's linked to increased rates of criminalization. And even into adulthood among victims of bullying and people who are both victims and bullies, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, for both of those categories, we see increased rates of anxiety and depression and suicidal thinking far into the future. Not for most people, but we do see higher rates. So when we're talking about this definition of bullying, I think we've identified a real problem that is worth addressing. What I want to make clear to you, though, is we're not talking about every single argument and fight that kids get into. In fact, most of the conflict kids involve themselves in doesn't meet the definition of bullying that I'm talking about. And maybe when you reflect back on your own experience, you'll still feel like bullying is the right word for it. Obviously, this is a word we use with lots of different kinds of meanings and situations. But I want to argue that a lot of times kids need to experience and figure out how to manage conflict in a way that shouldn't be labeled bullying, and which adults maybe need to have a somewhat hands-off approach about, right? Um, so a one-off kind of argument or fight wouldn't meet my definition. And even a running conflict among kids where the power dynamic is shifting back and forth, that might not really be bullying either. One of the other ways in which I think it's important to um, frame this topic is types of bullies and how that is something that's changed over time. So when I was growing up, and for other people in the audience who might possibly be my age or older, this is the kind of bully that we were most likely to experience and certainly think about. This is an image from the movie Back to the Future, a good old 1980s movie. And this is like the bully who is bigger than everyone else and who's going to like punch the victim in the face or steal their lunch money, right? This is also a type of bully that schools have had pretty good success in addressing. And so what you can see from this chart here is that the rate of this kind of experience of violent victimization has really gone down over time. The next type of bully, um, which I referred to earlier, are kids who are both bullies and victims. There are more of these kids um, that our children now are seeing, especially in the lower grades in elementary school. Um, kids who are in this category tend to have the most severe psychological problems. Um, they tend to be kids who sometimes are lashing out and sometimes they're on the receiving end of the bullying, but in either role, they're just really having trouble socializing. Um, sometimes there are kids who are hard for adults to deal with and hard for other people to deal with because they just haven't figured out how to easily relate to other people in the world. But for them, the bullying behavior tends to be really like a cry for help um, as opposed to a form of manipulation. My example of this category um, is Snape from the movie Harry Potter. Not actually easy to find someone who is both good and evil in a movie character. But if you remember your Harry Potter lore, um, Snape was actually bullied when he was a teenager at Hogwarts himself by Harry's, pa um, Harry's father, James. Um, so that's why he's in this slide right here. As kids get older, bullying, um, especially now, tends to become more covert and hidden. 
And this is the more kind of typical teenage figure, the kind of mean girl um, and mean boy. It's important to remember that boys do this behavior too, although we tend to think of it as something that's more prevalent among girls. These are the kids who are using bullying as a way to increase their own social status. And they tend to do it in these, as I was saying, these kind of covert, beneath the radar ways. So gossip and exclusion, maybe using an anonymous site online to cyberbully um, another kid, um, and things like eye rolling. You can't have a rule against eye rolling, right? Um, which is part of why this is just a harder behavior for schools and adults to recognize and deal with. But it's something that kids know that they are seeing around them. Um, and especially in middle school, that behavior tends to peak and then to continue somewhat in high school and even into college years. So one of the questions I ask in my book and in my research is what kind of effect is the internet having on this, these different types of bullies, on what, how kids are treating each other generally. This has been a huge cultural shift in teenagehood and adolescence, right? Um, you know, all of us are obviously very fluid now and we live our lives online, we live our lives in real life. Um, most of us don't even really think about those as two different worlds. But again, if you're my age or even younger, you didn't really grow up with all this access to social media and texting, which is one of the defining attributes of being a teenager today. And so one question is, okay, so what is, how is that changing what it's like to grow up and have friendships and relationships? From the point of view of kids who are targets of bullying, um, the internet means that it can be 24-7. So instead of getting a break at the end of the school day and thinking about something else, you may be drawn into watching people continue to be mean on whatever social media site or group text that they are using. Um, bullying online creates a visible and permanent record. It can be very stark when you read someone's words. They don't kind of disappear into the air the way the spoken word does. And you have this problem for kids of feeling exposed in front of a large audience. Um, kids, whatever social media site they're on, tend to be networked with lots and lots of other kids. And so that sense of exposure can be pretty real. And finally, you have a problem of this vicious cycle um, where kids will often try to respond in hopes of ending this thread of cyberbullying, which I, by which I just mean bullying online. Um, and instead, they'll just be kind of feeding the flames as the conflict continues. From the point of view of kids who are drawn to bullying, when you go online, you're not looking someone in the eye. You don't have the same kind of face-to-face -face feedback. And that can lead people to be harsher and meaner in the way they're, um, ex they're expressing themselves than they would be in real life. We've probably all seen this happen in the comments of a site online, right? You can be, it can be kind of shocking just how quickly a conversation will devolve to the lowest common denominator. And that, unfortunately, happens for kids on social media, too. Then there's this kind of license that anonymity can provide. Um, it's not available on all sites, but there tends to be a site or a couple of sites um, of the moment um, in which there is a lot of anonymity. Right now, Yik Yak is getting a lot of negative attention for this. There's also a site called Ask.fm um, where there's been an anonymity. When I was working on my book, it was a site called Formspring that is happily gone. But as you can tell from this list, there's like a whack-a-mole problem where one site may disappear because it gets a lot of negative attention, but then another one tends to pop up. And finally, online, you have this issue of impulsivity. Um, you know, I think many adults, I will certainly confess to this, have at some point pressed send on an email before they perhaps should have. With kids, that same impulse is there, but can even be harder for them to control because on average, the part of the teenage brain that develops um, last is, it involves executive function and impulse control. So there's a way in which the ease of pressing the send function um, online, texting, on social media, really plays into kids' vulnerabilities. So I think of all of this as adding up to an empathy challenge. Um, I don't mean to suggest that there aren't some really great things for teenagers about being online. It can be a source of amazing discovery um, for kids who feel isolated in communities where they're not um, finding a lot of people like them or they're feeling misunderstood. It can be a window into different communities. Um, 
that's all really positive, but I think it's also important to be realistic about some of the ways in which um, spending lots of time online can be hard for kids to deal with. And for me, this empathy um, problem is one that is a useful framing device. I'm going to play for you in a second a clip from the comedian Louis C.K. because um, he, in talking about his daughters and the way they and their friends use their phones, I think he really gets at what for me is the crux of the issue here. You know, I, I think these things are toxic, I don't, especially for kids. It's just this thing, it's bad. And right. they, they don't look at people when they talk to them and they don't build the empathy. You know, kids are mean and it's because they're trying it out. They, they, they look at a kid and they go, you're fat. And then they see the kid's face scrunch up and they go, ooh, that doesn't feel good to make a person do that. Right. But, they, but they gotta start with doing the mean thing. But when they write you're fat, then they just go, mmm, that was fun, I like that. <laughs> research that supports what Louis is saying here. Um, and it shows that there was, it's a study of about 3,500 girls in middle school. And the central findings were that the girls who were spending many hours online texting or using social media tend to be, tended to report fewer good feelings about kids they were friends with who were their age. Whereas the kids who had a lot of social contact that was face to face with kids tended to um, report healthy emotional relationships. But that kind of face to face contact is not really where kids' social lives are heading. So you can see from the numbers in these slides that increasingly the rising mode of communication for kids is social networking and texting with more and more time spent um, on devices. Um, again, there are some good things about all of that communication. It can be really useful, but it also has this sort of downside that um, I think is important for us to recognize as we're thinking about how to do the best job helping teenagers grow up. So all of this poses a question of what do we do about all of this? Um, and for me, there's a metaphor here of the garden that is useful. So you can plant a garden in one big empathy day um, at a school or by focusing you know, with your own kids at home in a concentrated way, but you can't just like check teaching empathy or character development off your list with one assembly or one well-intentioned event. You really have to keep this going in a daily way by nurturing and tending a garden and making a commitment to kind of weave into the fabric of your family or your community or your school this concern about the value of empathy and, um, and of thinking of a child's moral development over time. So. I'll talk a little bit about, in a minute, about what schools can do about this, but I want to start with parents because parents are just such an important part of the equation and I think sometimes, especially when a story of bullying goes wrong, we spend a lot of time blaming schools without thinking so much about what the roles of parents are. Um, and one of the tools that parents have, I think, for really instilling empathy as a value with kids is stories. So stories are a way, you all know this from your literature classes, of identifying with people who are different from us. Um, and I think that if you, as a parent, think of the opportunities that stories provide to um, start conversations with your kids, that can be a really natural way of bringing this into your home life. Um, it can be a story from a book, from a movie, from TV. Um, one of the crucial things here is to think of empathy not just as understanding someone else's feelings, but also as genuinely caring about them and wanting them to feel good. Um, some of the kids who are bullies, the more manipulative kids I was talking about before, they're pretty good at understanding how they make other people feel. They just don't really care. So that's sort of one of the um, shifts in mindset that I think is important here. There is a psychologist at Harvard whose work I um, admire and used in my book. His name is Richard Weisbord. And he has this question that he poses parents generally right now in the U.S. and I wonder if you all feel like it's relevant here too. Um, the question is whether parents today are giving so much priority to kids' individual achievement and happiness that they're losing sight of these questions about character and moral development. Um, and in thinking about this with my own kids um, and kind of translating it in a very concrete way, 
I ask myself whether if when my kids come home from school, if they tell me that they helped someone else or, you know, maybe stuck up for someone who seemed vulnerable, am I just as full of praise for that kind of achievement as I would be for like a good report card or a good mark on a paper? Because if I'm not, then what kind of message am I sending my kids about what I think is really important um, in their development? Within school and, and in community life generally, the power of bystanders is a really important tool for preventing bullying. Um, people often ask me what to do if their child is being bullied, um, or kids ask me what to do as a victim. And I have an answer for that, which I'm happy to um, talk about with you during the um, question and answer. But I want to start by thinking about all of us. What's our collective responsibility to address bullying? Because as you can see from this slide, we, um, ch communities of kids and adults, we have a lot of power here. Bullying usually takes place in front of a group, and when someone in that group decides to intervene, they can usually stop the bullying. But most of the time, we tend to make choices that don't involve directly intervening. And so then, for me, the important question is why? And what can we do to make this um, idea of intervening accessible to more people? And I want to argue for a definition of upstanding or intervening. Upstanding is a word that schools are using a lot now. And I think it's useful to have a term that really values um, stepping in. But I also want to um, argue to you that upstanding doesn't have to mean confronting an aggressive, intimidating bully in the moment. That's a really hard thing to do. And some kids will be capable of it, um, and sometimes that kind of intervention that's more heroic will be accessible. But because it's not easy, I think it's important to give kids other options too. And luckily, there is a significant piece of research, um, lots of survey um, by a former guidance counselor named Stan Davis, um, who's written a book about this. He surveyed thousands of kids who'd experienced bullying. And he asked them, this is kind of the inverse of the question I started out with, he asked these kids, what did your peers did, do that really made a difference and helped you as you were experiencing bullying? And what he found was that they were just as likely to name a small moment as a big act of heroism. So just sending someone a sympathetic text or putting your hand on their shoulder or asking if they're OK, all of those kinds of small moments can make a real difference to a kid who is the target of bullying. And those are things that, for many kids, are seem like they're within range. They don't involve some big act um, of standing up to a scary person. They're more about standing with the victim than they are about standing up to a bully. And so I think if we can broaden that um, idea of intervention to these kinds of small moments, we'll both be able to pull in more kids, hopefully to change the numbers that you see in this slide. And we'll be doing a lot to help um, the kids who are targets of bullying, too. This is an example of a kind of small moment from one of the stories in my book. Um, Monique is the, um, a, one of the main characters in my book. She was a girl who experienced a lot of bullying in seventh and eighth grade, so much so that her mom actually pulled her out of school because she was just so frustrated with the school's um, unsuccessful efforts to help her daughter. Monique was in a boxing team outside of school, and she decided to drop out of the boxing team um, as well because she was just really feeling depressed and down about herself. But the coach of the team, when he learned about what was going on, he pulled a bunch of uh, he pulled the rest of the team, a group of girls together, and asked them to help Monique. Which, if you think about it, is pretty unusual. We don't often level with a group of teenagers about one kid's problems and then turn to them for help. But this coach was a skilled social worker, and he felt like he knew these girls. Um, and one of the girls was a leader on the team, Julie Beth, who you see here. She had been in school with Monique and hadn't done anything. She'd seen the bullying, but like everyone else, she had stayed out of it. When her coach asked her for help, though, she wanted, she cared about his good opinion of her, and she sort of thought about it in a different way. So she did a couple of small things. She called Monique at home and asked her to come back to the boxing team. 
not a huge act of courage, but it really made a big difference in Monique's life that year because even though she was um, out of school, she did come back to the team and that team remained a really important source of support for her. And then the other intervention um, that I learned about that Julia Beth did was here online on Facebook. There was this thread of really pretty mean stuff happening and Julia Beth was able to stop it with just this, these four words in which she said that Monique was her friend. This is an area in which the distancing online was actually helpful. Um, it was probably easier for Julie Beth to say this on Facebook than it would have been to do in real life. And so that's an example of the kinds of um, intervention and healthy, good use of um, social media and the internet, which I think we should be talking more to kids about. I want to say a word about resilience. Um, this is Monique about a year later. She was able to go to a different school. She was really a kid who needed a fresh start. Um, she is uh, shown here with a tutor from a school called Wesleyan in Connecticut who helped her while she was outside of school. And one of the important things about her story to emphasize is that most kids really do recover from bullying. Um, so even though we need to be concerned about the minority for whom it's really hard to overcome, it's also important to remember that most kids do figure out how to be resilient. And one of the ways in which it might help us to expand that pool is to, is to impress on kids that that is a shift that takes place and a way in which they might change their own mindset about the fixed categories of social life in high school. Um, there's a psychologist named um, Carol Dweck who's gotten a lot of attention for working on mindset in an academic setting. What you tell kids about what you expect them to be able to learn can really make a difference in how capable they think they are um, on the next test they take or the next course. And Carol Dweck has a younger colleague named David Yeager who very recently has been publishing research suggesting that this idea of shifting mindset, of teaching kids essentially that the brain is plastic, that identities change over time, can actually be a powerful tool pre for preventing bullying. Um, David Yeager's theory is that the, and he has numbers to back this up, that kids who believe that the categories of bully and loser are very fixed are likely to be more invested in being mean because they see maintaining social status as something that is going to matter in the long term. Um, if they let the uncool kids sit with them at the lunch table, well, that could like ruin their social standing forever. It sounds kind of silly, but if you think about it, there's plenty of um, assumptions that are being made like that in middle school and high school. And so David introduced an exercise um, to try to get kids to understand that those categories are not fixed. He has them do some reading about the brain, about neurological development, as specifically as it relates to social identity. And he's found that at the end of that intervention, it's a pretty brief um, kind of intervention, that kids' behavior and their sense of self um, really can shift. And so I think that kind of personal way of addressing the motivations of bullying and trying to shift kids' internal psychology about that is um, a promising avenue for more research. I also, it's important to think about the cultural shift that a school needs to go through to really prevent bullying. Um, some schools get this idea or have for a long time, even if they don't call it bullying prevention, um, they have been thinking about how to instill the values of valuing other people, of empathy, of social and emotional development. But at other schools, this is more of a challenge. Perhaps they've been more focused on academics. Perhaps it's a school where there's just a fair amount of aggression in the culture and kids are acting like bullies because they don't want to be the next victim. One of the biggest challenges um, is high school. So bullying intervention programs that are essentially teaching kids not to bully, they tend to be effective in elementary school and for part of middle school, and then their, their um, results really fall off. And perhaps what's going on there, a lot of researchers have um, argued, is that kids just get tired of this didactic messages. And it's enough, they've heard don't bully a lot of times, that starts to seem kind of infantilizing to them. And they really probably need to be taking more control of their own education. So this slide is about an anti-smoking campaign called um, Truth, uh, 
which is, was really encouraging teenagers to think of Big Tobacco as this establishment authority figure that was trying to control them and manipulate them and to have the teenagers see rebelling against the tobacco companies as a way of taking more power and control over their own lives. It's been a really successful campaign which I think added to some of the earlier efforts and, and in some ways really turned on its head the whole idea of just don't do drugs. Just don't do drugs, don't bully. Those aren't necessarily messages that older teenagers are going to respond to. And so I think what we have here is an example of the kind of campaign that can give kids a sense of autonomy and control. Um, the messaging about drunk driving is, uh, has a sort of similar lesson. As you can see here, there's been real success, um, real public health gains in helping um, teenagers uh, not do drunk driving as much as they used to. And again, this is a campaign that had many dimensions over time, but one of the more successful kinds of campaigns have tried to give teenagers the tools to change this behavior themselves. And this is a, a sort of third slice at this same idea. Um, schools that do surveys internally about bullying tend to find that most kids don't bully and most kids don't like bullying. And then when schools broadcast that message with a better design set of flyers or posters or messaging, hopefully that kids themselves can help come up with, then they tend to see the rate of bullying go down even further. Because the lesson here is that this isn't normal behavior. It's not something that everyone does. And it's not OK to do it um, in the sense that you just think you're following along with the pack. And when kids can absorb that message, especially if they're part of figuring out how to make it an effective message, that can really help um, a community and a school. This is an example of that kind of um, shift that I'm talking about um, from a Catholic girls' school in Queens that I went to visit. Uh, the seniors, in order to graduate, had to come up with a project that would benefit the community. So a couple of years ago, they came up with this idea of delete day, where they were going to invite the younger students into the school computer lab on their free period and go through with them this list that the seniors came up with of ways in which they might want to clean up the way they were, the kids were presenting themselves online. It was an experiment. The principal of the school was really skeptical that the younger students were going to want to show up and use their free time in this way. But she handed the computer lab um, over to the seniors for the day. And I drove down to see how this was all going to work. Um, and it turned out to be an event where about two thirds of the school showed up and very dutifully spent 45 minutes cleaning up their Facebook pages or this old, sometimes taking themselves off of this site called Formspring that I told you about. What was really clear about this event was that it was effective because the older students were running the show. They were the ones walking around the room with the clipboards, giving the younger girls advice about um, how to handle being online, telling stories of the problems and troubles they'd encountered themselves when they were younger. So to me, the lesson here is obvious. Um, first of all, this idea, again, of giving teenagers control over how they're imparting this kind of prevention and education. And second, I think that older teenagers can be a really important resource for schools that is often underutilized. Um, we don't often kind of turn over education to 15 and 16 and 17 year olds. But especially when we're talking about this whole dilemma of how to be a digital native, they're the people with the direct experience of it. Um, and sometimes the kids who've had the most trouble and maybe caused the most trouble themselves in middle school or early in high school have the most wisdom to impart um, if we're willing to hand over the power and the reins to them. I wanted to say a word about the social media companies. We spend a lot of time blaming and talking about schools' role in bullying, some amount of time on parents. We rarely talk about these companies. But the truth is that a lot of bullying and harassment is taking place on these sites all the time um, That in a way that is supposed to be against their own rules. They all have rules against bullying and harassment that they're not really enforcing. Um, the CEO of Twitter recently said, you know, this is a huge problem on our site and we just haven't really figured it out yet. That's basically true on all of these sites.
And I think the reason for that is that we, the consumers, have not demanded enough from these companies about the role they should be playing um, and the way that they can really um, help kids by making this site a place where there's more response to bullying and harassment. And in addition to complaining, to responding to individual complaints, which is very time consuming, school, these sites could also just be involving schools, principals, guidance counselors, um, asking them how the sites are playing out in their communities and trying to use their experiences to change the way the sites are constructed. Uh, when I was working on my book, I spent a day at the headquarters of Facebook um, in Silicon Valley trying to talk about these issues. And it was this whole idea of bringing in s people from schools, working with schools directly, was very foreign to the culture of Facebook. Um, just not really something they'd considered. And I think the sites are so worried about seeming like they are still cool to teenagers. They don't want to be identified with schools and the kind of authoritarian identity that um, professional educators sometimes have. But I think it's really a missed opportunity. And as I was saying, one that the companies are only going to start playing a different role when we decide to make them play that role. One of the reasons that um, we're paying more attention to bullying right now um, in certain parts of the world is that by a number of measures, today's teenagers are actually doing better than my generation was. Um, kind of important to remember that uh, adolescents, we, we think of this as always things are getting worse, but it's not actually true by these um, important measures. And that's often true, uh, that's actually also true of suicide rates among adolescents, um, which have been linked to bullying in a very alarming way in the last few years. But when you take a deep breath and move away from the stories, um, the anecdotes, to looking at this more generally, then you see that, in fact, the rate of suicide has, is not rising, which should be comforting. Um, oops, started that before I meant to. Uh, I wanted to end with um, an attempt to talk about certain kind of bullying um, in Ireland. This is a public service announcement um, that a group in Ireland put together. And I like to show it as a way of thinking about small moments um, in preventing bullying. You can think about whether you feel like this really is a small moment or not. And also to get people thinking about what issues are coming up in high schools or middle schools in your community. Um, how you feel like this kind of intervention could be relevant. Whether this might be a good teaching tool um, in a school that you know or among kids you know. Um, this is a video that has gotten some attention among schools in the United States that have kind of used it to get kids to think about the kind of issue in their own school that might foster this kind of um, behavior from other kids. Good day. Yeah. Where did you go? I uh, bought like 50 albums the week before the tickets come out. Oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> we're alone now. Come on, there's people around. There's nobody around. Come on. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. A name is that yeah. pull up, pulls up in the car. We knew it. <laughs> 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 it's our board, is it? It's your business here, it is, right? <laughs> ah, give us a kiss. <laughs> <laughs>
Look who it is. No one holding your hand today, is there? <laughs> I'll hold your hand. Thanks so much for listening. I'm looking forward to taking some questions. Thank you. I think you're going to get chair six and six. Great. I don't have quite the Stephen Colbert interviewing style down. <laughs> That's all right. So can we open it? I don't know if you can. Oh. Oop. That you or me that was. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but it's uh, over. Uh, yeah, Eduardo, do you want to ask the first question? But you want to go to the mic because we're recording the, the discussion. I think my mic is the one that's up too high. Okay, great. So I'll start with the first one. You can remind me if I forget uh, the second one. So uh, the politics in the U.S. have, to simplify for a moment, worked like this. Um, bullying started to get a lot of attention in a very alarmist way, particularly by being linked to suicides in the United States starting like about four or five years ago. Um, I kind of resist this as a journalist because there was a lot of oversimplifying going on, a lot of blaming individual kids who got labeled bullies, usually, not always. There is some um, correlation, I should say, between bullying and suicide, but we don't know whether um, it's before or after. It's not a simple cause and effect. Um, and so the storyline seemed to me like they were um, pretty destructive, and there was a lot of talk of punishment um, and even some criminalizing of behavior, which um, seemed, again, like it was disproportionate and not really the most sensible response. Um, you know, really, suicide is almost always the major risk factor is depression um, and the underlying mental health issues going on. So without saying that bullying um, never plays a role or without letting kids off the hook, this, the idea of putting some, a teenager in prison for the, the death of another kid seemed to me, and a lot of people, I think, like the wrong move. So that is sort of the context for a lot of the political discussion. Um, as a journalist, I tend to resist the idea that an overblown, exaggerated set of stories can have a useful outcome. But I do think that in some ways the attention in the US did help galvanize um, a wave of state lawmaking. And some of it was worrisome to me because, again, it was all about punishment. But a lot of it, by the time it moved from the legislature to the schools, turned out to be more focused on prevention and education, which is probably a good thing. I think it's not entirely clear that bullying is an easy problem to legislate away. 
Um, schools in the U.S. now tend to be mandated to report bullying and to have some kind of education program in place. How well that really plays out on the ground, I think, is an open question. You know, as I mentioned, in high school in particular, we really don't have bullying prevention programs that have been shown to work. Um, but that's been sort of the political dynamic. Uh, so you asked also about free speech and cyberbullying. So this is a very live issue in the American courts. Um, we have a, f a long time First Amendment principle in the United States that um, the constitutional rights, including free speech, don't stop at the schoolhouse door. But in fact, a lot of free speech rights for kids do stop at the schoolhouse door. Um, and one big unresolved question is, when you have cyberbullying going on outside of school, often, you know, kids own phones, they're not linked to school directly at all, can kids be punished for that behavior? Parents often come to school administrators and guidance counselors asking for help because the relationships among the kids are rooted in the school context. Um, and in a lot of states, what's happened is that schools have applied the same standards that they do to in-school speech, which is that if the speech is materially disrupting the school or causing a hostile environment for a child, then another kid can be punished. Um, a lot of American courts have said that's fine. A few have said no, out of school speech should have a different standard. Schools should not be able to suspend kids. And thus far, we have a kind of unresolved legal picture going on. Um, eventually, perhaps the United States Supreme Court will take one of these cases, but that just hasn't, hasn't happened yet. Hello, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I'm from a small part of India called Kerala, where I think the whole situation is quite different, because the, pre this, the prevalence of social media isn't really that deep there. So it's really popular among the younger generation and among middle school and high school kids, but especially among parents, it's not really there at all. So the thing is, the kind of challenges that they face there is quite different. On one aspect, you have some parents who believe that Bullying is sort of a social process that children have to go through. It's like an initiation almost. Mm -hmm. And there's the other aspect that some like parents or there's this social mindset that children should not be involved in this process. It's like you, one of the uh, good counting measures you, you suggested was, was involving the senior students in the process. But that's not allowed actually in some of these societies where they consider it to be a, a hierarchy issue that children can't take positions from other children and stuff. How do you think you can sort of tackle these issues in, uh, in developing societies like in Canada and India, apart from the US? That's a great question. Um, that idea that bullying is like a rite of passage that everyone goes through was very much the reigning set of assumption in the United States, I would say even like 10 years ago. Um, and still, when my book came out, you know, I was on lots of like radio shows and the um, older radio host tended to say before the show started, like, really? You really wrote a whole book about this? Isn't this just kids being kids? And I would say, well, you know, there really are these harmful consequences. And when you think of, you know, real cruelty and how devastating it can be for kids, like, is that really something we want to be putting up with? Um, I think that, uh, you know, that kind of message where um, kind of calling people on their tolerance for this behavior and really, unfortunately, surfacing some of the harmful consequences can be a way that um, communities change their approach to this. But I completely understand that it's not easy. And in parts of the world where people are having much more basic um, problems, it may not seem like the big priority. On the other hand, bullying really, you know, cuts across every single culture, um, and it, because of the psychological toll that it takes, even though those costs aren't necessarily as apparent as physical harm, it, it really does matter over time. Um, so I think for that reason it's um, important to address, but I can imagine it being a harder sell. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, I found one of these organizations called Make a Difference back at home, and uh, we tried to do the same idea where we step into schools and we pay like a mentor to grow students who are doing all these problems. So I think it's really nice to see that this issue is being discussed at a global level apart from additional community basis. So thank you for the attention to the problem. Thank you. That sounds like great work that you're doing. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Nadal, for your speech. I actually have two questions. I was a victim of bullying from my teacher in primary school 
who misconstrued and took personally my poor performance in the subject. Uh, he was my Chinese teacher, and I recall him telling me that he would write a letter to my parents, but he didn't think my parents would care. I also recall him singling me out uh, during a classroom uh, sentence forming exercise and getting the class to clap sarcastically for me when I got um, a question right. So my question is, teachers are typically allowed and encouraged to discipline. They typically find themselves in positions of power, but sometimes we see that this results in bullying, by your definition, unintentionally being institutionalized. What do you think are some other significant obstacles today to the propagation of empathy? Right. Well, that sounds like an abuse of power. Um, and because teachers automatically have more power than their students, um, it can be really hard for kids to deal with. Um, and the idea of using humiliation essentially as a tool of control or maybe in a misguided way um, as a tool of learning really is an unsuccessful and harmful strategy. You know, it's just so important for adults to role model the kinds of behavior that we want to see from kids. And when I was doing research for my book and going to a lot of different schools, I realized that if I spent time in a school, enough time that everyone just sort of forgot I was there, which doesn't actually take very long, um, I would find that in the schools where the teachers were making cutting remarks to students or sniping at each other, there was more bullying. It wasn't surprising, really, that the kids were um, reflecting back at the adults the way they were acting. And also, the teachers can do a lot of harm on their own, um, just in the ways you were talking about. So you know, that seems to me where, for students, that's a very challenging environment to be in, because you don't necessarily have enough authority in the world to challenge an adult's behavior. But um, there has to be a kind of community-wide ethos that teachers just can't act like that, and that's not socially acceptable anymore. Thank you. My second question is on bystanders. In psychology, there's a well-documented uh, well phenomenon known as the diffusion of responsibility. Uh, so do you think overcoming this condition specifically um, through education programs is a worthwhile way to deal with bullying? So you're absolutely right. You're talking about the bystander effect, which has been studied a lot, that if there's a group of people, one person in the group, and everyone will sort of affirm each other. And if, if, if you, one sees that other people are not stepping up, then it makes it easier to decide not to do that um, yourself. And I do think that helped explain that slide I was showing you before about why so few kids intervene. I, while it's still early on in this kind of world of this upstander campaign that schools are waging to try to change the way kids think about this, I do feel hopeful about that because if you give kids, as I was saying, multiple ways in which they can be upstanders um, and, the, and kids feel like they need to be taking that responsibility, that's a message if you instill it at a young age that I think kids can really carry with them. So I do feel hopeful about that, although I can't Point to a study. Point you to a study showing yes, for sure. We know that this works. Thank you, Emily. Um, the uh, you know you've talked about middle school about the decreasing effectiveness in high school, and you also talked about the way that all of this is related to, um, you know, I guess what we call digitally native and, and that sort of thing. Uh, you've in the past written a lot about things that happen in universities. Have you thought at all about how, what the effect of this kind of culture, and not, not to exaggerate the, the, the extent of this culture of cyberbullying and so on, but does it continue into colleges and universities, or do you have any sense of what happens uh, to these kinds of interactions when you get a little further along the educational spectrum? Yes. Um, so, you know, so luckily, we do see bullying peak in high school and then start to go down. And I, part of that is just that people start to, ki, uh, teenagers, people, college students have a sense that there is more than one way to be socially successful. Um, and there isn't such a hierarchy. Um, and that kind of opens avenues to different ways of having friendships and relationships, all of which is healthy. And yet, there is still, you know, some cruelty and social exclusion um, at older ages. And I think that um, 
these same problems we see online of the kind of casual cruelty where you don't really realize what effect you're having. And sometimes people try out a kind of persona online that they wouldn't necessarily adopt in real life. Those are definitely features of college campuses. And the kinds of um, problems of an anonymous gossip, uh, um, particularly of a sexual nature, those are things that college campuses have really struggled with. Uh, and this sometimes schools find that there is a website that's localized, where there's just all kinds of really mean gossip you know, scandalous uh, and even, you know, libelous and slanderous content. And the problem is that the university doesn't, because of free speech and the free internet, there isn't really a way for a university to effectively shut down a site like that. And so I think you have to rely on bringing people together and trying to get them to communally kind of reject that way of communicating um, and realizing that everyone has a stake in um, ending sites like that so that the community functions better as a whole. Even if it's just a few people who are being victimized, it's going to, in the end, affect everybody. Uh, so are, are you aware of any successful college and university efforts to control that kind of thing? Or is it basically uh, just harder to do it when you get to that? That well, level. so I was, I heard recently a story about a prep school, a boarding school in the States called Andover, which is like a super uh, prestigious, fancy school. Um, I was doing an event with their headmaster, and he was talking about exactly this issue um, with, I think, this, a site called Whisper, which is very much all about, like, the local network. You see what other people are anonymously posting based on location. So it came to his attention that kids were using this in all kinds of nasty ways in Andover. He realized that he could actually block the technology from coming in because it's a boarding school. Everyone's right there. Perhaps you could do this right here. So he figured out he had the capability. And then for about 10 minutes one day, he got his IT guy to block Whisper. And then he called the kids together and he said, you know what? I have figured out how to block the site. But I know that's not going to work as the more permanent answer to this. We have to decide as a community to get rid of this here. So I want all of you to pull out your phones now or in a few minutes and, you know, delete this app from your phone. I'm going to do it right now. I've had it on my phone because I've been checking up on you guys, but I'm going to take it off of my phone. And I don't want to have to keep checking up on you. I want to be able to trust you as a community to delete this. He says that it worked. Um, I'm not sure if it would, could, would work everywhere, but I think that he was able to instill this sense among the students that they were actually better off without this. And the thing about a site like this is if nobody's looking at it, it ceases to exist. It ceases to have any power. So he was essentially getting the students to take away the power that the site um, held over the school. Great. I should be asking everyone to introduce themselves when they ask a question. Uh, I have two questions. Um, the first is you uh, talked about a study where uh, you found that I think it was in Chicago where students who spend time on the internet um, have lower perception of the students around them. And my question is actually about causation. Um, having grown up in the internet age, um, students are finding tremendous sources of sort of resilience and communities on the internet right now. And so my question, um, the first one is, um, is it that the students who are on the internet are finding negative things about themselves and then feeling that their peers are bad people? Or is it that they feel that their peers are bad people, they're logging onto the internet, and they're finding a community of support? Um, because we found that effect at many places. Yeah, so this particular study was 3,500 12-year-old to 14-year-old girls, and they were going online and using social media to socialize with their peers. Um, so different, I think, from the second example you were talking about of people reaching outside of their immediate communities for sources of support online, which is certainly something else that, you know, we can document and see happening. And the other thing about this study is it involved girls who were online for several hours a day. So it doesn't mean that, you know, social media is bad writ large. It was more, I, th I think, I interpret those results as being about a kind of overuse of the medium. 
Um, one example of the kind of positive use of the internet that has mattered a lot for bullying is the It, it's get, it Gets Better campaign um, that has taken off in the States and internationally. Uh, and this, again, has to do with what I was talking about of a fluid notion of identity. So for this campaign, it was giving the message to teenagers LG, in the LGBT community who are struggling um, based on where they live, that like things change and they get better as you get older. And so that seems to me to be a very moving, positive use of online connections to give kids a greater sense of possibility, which certainly the internet can provide. And uh, my second question is uh, the question of schools and their involvement in social media. Um, the thought of schools being involved, for instance, at Facebook um, is sort of a new idea to me. Um, yes, but, Facebook is yeah, yeah. Um, Well, I think it's also because um, a lot of the stories I've read in sort of recent history are questions of um, schools who sort of have monitoring spyware on, on laptops that they give out, um, students who get penalized for instance like saying something bad about a teacher on Facebook and then they get two weeks of suspension, they, you know, and there's that sort of that idea of privacy, so I, I'm just a little more curious about um, what a school's um, involvement in social media looks like. Um, and how they would drop sort of rules for that. Because I totally, I absolutely understand sort of the idea of them being involved and talking about cyberbullying, especially because it's where students spend the other 12 hours of their day. Um, on the other hand, it's obviously um, a, an idea of sort of who rules the home and what students say about school. Yeah, so I'm not a big fan of the idea of um, spyware and the, the more um, authoritarian responses online, especially not from schools. I think it's one thing for parents to decide that with their own kids, but for schools to be playing that role just feels too um, big brother to me. So what I was talking about was more having um, Facebook ask guidance counselors, administrators, like, what kinds of cyberbullying issues are coming up for you at your school? And then are there things that we, Facebook, could do to help you prevent it? So, you know, for example, at some schools, gangs will use social media sites as a way, a way of organizing. Someone will put up a video on YouTube or a sort of call for everyone to gather. And if the administrators knew that was happening ahead of time, they might be able to do something to stop it. And you would, if you were monitoring the social media, or even if you weren't monitoring, if you had some kind of um, algorithm or program running where you could see a sort of network effect of like lots and lots of communicating with, uh, you know, words about fighting, for example, you would be able to see that brush fire going on um, in your social media company, and then you could tell the school, just like alert them, there might be some problem here. Or if, if we could come up, and there have been um, researchers who have started to work on this, if you could come up with some an algorithm, you're never going to catch all of the words about bullying, right? But in fact, a lot of the social media related bullying, like bullying in real life, is very predictable. It's about people's looks, their weight, their sexuality. There are certain code words for all of that. So maybe you set up a program not where you're trying to censor kids' messages, but if you see a really mean word or a phrasing that the computer can recognize as being often related to bullying, then the program could send back a message to the person posting it saying, like, do you really want to send this to 300 people? Even just like a 30-second delay in the architecture might have some effect. And to me, that doesn't seem so draconian or Big Brother-ish that I wouldn't be interested in seeing that kind of um, experimenting going on um, with these companies. But it is not something that they have been interested in so far. Though I understand Yik Yak has just recently started doing that. Yeah, they're trying to sort of start slowing some things down because they've gotten so much criticism. Yeah. So, so be I interesting think, uh, to see that. Liz, maybe our last question for tonight. So yeah, uh, my name is Liz. My question, my question is, we focus a lot on how social media can be an outlet for bullying. What about a potential cause? Because as you said, it's an opportunity for people to try on new personalities and see mean things that they wouldn't see in real life. So my question is, is it possible that bullying not just translates from one medium to another, um, aka from face to face to online? but rather it actually increases. And then, so by getting rid of cyberbullying sites, are we actually addressing the problem um, of nasty thoughts going around and actual rumors going around, or are we simply changing the medium? Right. So 
It really depends how you ask the question. A lot of the studies of cyberbullying didn't use the more limited, restrictive, repeated over time power imbalance um, variables I was talking about earlier. And so if you don't use those variables and you essentially ask kids, have you seen anything mean online or anything insulting, you'll get much higher rates um, of bullying than you would about real life questions. I don't think personally that's so useful. Um, although I do think kids are seeing a lot that is mean and abusive online, it doesn't necessarily mean that things are so terrible um, online so much as that we're using this much looser definition. Um, and I think the question, the jury's sort of out on whether getting rid of a particular site means that you're sort of cleaning that up and erasing that possibility from a teenager's life or whether they're likely to just move on to the next site. Um, as I was saying earlier, there do tend to be a lot of these sites. And I think in the end, it's some combination, right? So the architecture of a site and the opportunities kids have for anonymity can fuel the bullying and, and make it take on these kinds of psychologically devastating forms that maybe it didn't have before. But the root cause of it is still kids' own sense of identity and their struggle and um, aspirations to kind of hold on to this negative sense of social status. Um, and so that is the sort of underlying cause. We're really talking now about the expressions of that behavior, I think. Well, th oh, OK, I'll, I'll leave the last question to a parent, Greg. The reason I am standing up now is exactly because I am a parent. And the one thing that sort of bothered me throughout this is the, the role of the parent that hasn't been that apparent. And by that I mean, uh, when, when my first child, and my wife and I went to our first child's parent-teacher meeting, the kid was like four years old, he was in Miss Porter's nursery school. And we were all excited to trot off to school and hear how little Johnny, Johnny not his name, but how little Johnny was doing, we got there and the teacher said he's doing quite nicely, he did sing quite well, and he has an amazing sense of empathy, developed beautifully. So we turned to each other, we looked at each other, we turned back to Miss Porter and we said, you know, what are you talking about empathy? He's four years old. We thought we were coming here to find out that he can add two and two and that he plays well and his paintings are fantastic. And she said to us, oh no, studies have shown that if empathy isn't developed by a certain age in the early part of life, it really never is. So we walked away with that saying, wow, that's a pretty serious statement from Miss Porter. When I come back to the role of the parent, I feel as a parent, my wife and I have spent our years trying to be there for our children to help them learn, understand, and play fairly in the world that they live in. And the reason I stood up right now is I think it's all well and good to talk about cyberbullying and all the other manifestations of technology today. But many of the people in this audience are someday going to be parents. And what I'm actually saying, as opposed to asking, is that I believe that their role in parenting is going to be paramount to how their children will ultimately deal with whatever it is life presents to them. Thank you. I, I'm certainly all for parents thinking um, very seriously about this and um, was trying to address some of those um, issues by giving people strategies. I also think, though, that we're never going to have all the parents behaving in the way um, we want. And so for that reason, it's also important for schools and communities to take this issue on, too. Great. Well, uh, let's all thank Emily. And I think Zach has a couple of words to say at the end of the uh, evening. <laughs>